Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So in this video, I wanna talk about a real world project that I've worked on as a blockchain developer. I wanna talk about you know, the problems that I had to solve on this project and also you know, my thought process for solving those, what I did, and you know, the technologies that I used and also look at a couple code examples today. So before we get into that, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the like button down below. And as always, you can download my courses for free on my website over at dappuniversity.com forward slash free download. All right, so let's talk about this project. This was a freelance project. This was a, a client who approached me um, just through my website and through my email address. And you can email me at gregory at dappuniversity.com uh, if you want to work on our project together. So, you know, I, I did this project as a freelancer and I talk a lot about freelancing on this channel, you know, how you can get started as a freelance blockchain developer. So check out those videos if you haven't already. But I did this project as a freelancer and the client came to me, you know, with a really big uh, awesome project in mind, right? And the project relied pretty heavily on the blockchain, right? And it specifically used a token as part of the app. Okay, this is a full-on project, right? It had a website that users could log into. Um, they have profiles. They have a bunch of stuff they can do inside the application. Um, and a token was an essential part of this. And storing information on the blockchain was also an essential part of this application, right? But there's lots of different things the app needed to do. You know, need to register users. The users needed to be able to do things inside the application. There's a lot of you know business logic. It's a pretty complex app, as many real-world apps are, right? So let me pull up my screen here and kind of, you know, talk about what needed to happen. So, you know, it was a, it was a full website um, that had, you know, a front end and it had, uh, you know, a back end and it had a database, right? All right. And so there were, you know, all these different moving parts, a front end website, you know, a back end and a database. Sorry, this kind of looks like chicken scratch, but you get the idea. And then also, you know, all these parts rely pretty heavily on the blockchain. And I kind of came into this problem where I didn't want any of these pieces necessarily to rely too heavily on the blockchain itself for a couple different reasons. You know, when I was approached to work on this project, it was all very new, right? And they didn't have really much built yet. There was no application to integrate things into. So in order to build something on the blockchain, there were a lot of decisions that hadn't been made yet. We didn't know what the back end was going to be written in. We didn't know the programming languages. We didn't know the frameworks. We didn't know what type of server it was going to run on. Same thing for the client side application. I didn't know if it would be a separate application. Um, I didn't know if it would be the same you know, as the back end, if it was going to be all one app or something like that. There are a lot of unknowns, right? And so because of that, what I decided to do um, that's not the only reason, but for many reasons, that being one of them, I decided to build the blockchain portion of the application um, separately, all right? And I'll talk about how I did that. Okay, so basically the front end was going to be on one web server, the back end was going to be on one web server, the database on a separate server, and then, of course, the blockchain isn't a server. It's, you know, the blockchain is by itself over here, the real blockchain. So this is an Ethereum project, I should clarify. So here's the Ethereum blockchain over here. What I decided to do was build a separate server right here, a, a microservice, an API that interfaced with the blockchain. All right. So this app relied pretty heavily on a token, right? And this token um, needed to be accessed inside the app. New tokens need to be created. People need to be able to transfer tokens and things like that. All right. All right, so there are two kind of pieces here. One was the token itself, which I developed, and you know that got deployed to the blockchain itself. All right, and the other component was being able to actually interact with the token inside the app. You know, read all the information about who held the tokens, let people do things with the tokens, let them you know uh, transfer tokens and things like that, all from the app itself. All right, so. Basically, you know, you could accomplish that a couple different ways. You could talk directly to the blockchain um, or with the front end app or the web server. But the problem is there were certain restrictions. Um, basically, we're going to we're going to give people tokens inside the application. And you, we couldn't do that necessarily directly from either of these two instances, either the back end or the front end. Right. And also, we didn't know necessarily um, whether 
the tech, we didn't we hadn't decided on the technologies that were going to be used for the application rep. So I didn't know if there would be uh, libraries that would support the backend. So if the backend was built in some other programming language that didn't have a good library to interact with the blockchain, that could be a limiting factor, right? And there are also lots of other developers on the team, and I didn't necessarily know if they would understand how to interact with the blockchain. I was the blockchain specific, you know, member of the team, all right? So what I decided to do was create my own microservice, my own API that accepted basically HTTP requests. So it was a REST-based API that acted on behalf of the blockchain, right? So the blockchain to be able, this, this REST API is able to sign transactions that would go on the blockchain and things like that. And also store some data about the app. A lot of specific stuff kind of all in one microservice. And there's a lot of you know advantages that we got out of that, right? Basically, it didn't require other developers to know how to use the blockchain. They were able to basically, uh, you know, send uh, HTTP requests directly to this API to interact with the blockchain. It also got all your blockchain behavior and housed it into one application. Um, and just like any other time you're migrating in microservices, you know, a big advantage of this is upgradability. You know, I could upgrade this server, you could upgrade that server without having to worry about, you know, certain things breaking, all right? So, you know, there's a lot of advantages that we got out of this type of design and it's going really well. Like, I, I'm really glad that we did it this way. And, you know, like I said, also it doesn't have, it, it means that other programmers don't have to know blockchain in order to use this. It, it gives them a common language for them to speak in between. Um, you know, most developers are going to be familiar with how to make uh, requests to a REST API, but maybe not necessarily a blockchain, right? And, you know, the programming languages, whatever the server is written in, or sorry, the server-side code is written in, you know, you didn't necessarily have to have a library that supports that, all right? So that's why I did what I did. So let's talk about, you know, the technologies that I used and how I accomplished this, okay? So the first kind of fork in the road was being able to, you know, talk to the blockchain itself inside of a REST API, okay? So that left me only a few options. You know, I, I, I needed to talk to an Ethereum node in order to interact with the blockchain. And so I could, you know, talk to a node directly with RPC. I could hand roll something to do that, but that seems crazy. Um, so I decided to, you know, use a library like Web3, right? And that left me a few options. You know, I talked about Web3 a lot on my channel. If you're not familiar with that, you can go check out my Web3.js videos and also my Web3 uh, uh, for Python videos. I've got uh, articles out for both of those, actually. So, you know, yeah, those are a couple options. I could do Web3.js or I could do Web3 for Python, right? So that means I'd either have to write an API and something like Node.js, like with Express, or I would use uh, some sort of Python backend like Django or Flask or something like that and use a Web3 library that's native to those languages. So for lots of different reasons, I went with uh, Web3 for Python, all right? Because I could build an API in Python and use uh, Web3 to talk to the blockchain, all right? So here's Web3 documentation get pulled up right here. And so once I figured that out, I was like, so which, you know, API do I want to use? I decided to go for Django. I've used Django and Flask um, just for a lot of reasons. I went with Django mostly because of Django REST, REST framework, which makes it really easy to bootstrap APIs um, and build something really fast, right? So if you aren't familiar with Django REST framework, I really, I like it a lot. Um, it's a really great way for building uh, APIs with Python. So this is the Django REST framework documentation. All right, so I've got some of the code from the API pulled up here. I've changed some of the names because I don't want to give too much away about the project. Um, but I'll talk about this does. So Django, you know, has Django REST framework, which I'm using here. And Django uses views to manage requests. All right. So basically, whenever a request comes in, it hits a, a, a view which decides basically what to do with the request and all the data that comes in, right? It could talk to some models. Um, it could, you know, do lots of different things, right? So if, you're not, if you're familiar with MVC, it's kind of how that works, okay? So what I decided to do is create a, uh, uh, sorry, a view. I want to say a controller. That's like Ruby on Rails. But this is a view. 
uh, they basically handle the incoming request, right? So what does this view do? Well, it, it actually mints tokens, and that's something the app was supposed to do. It was supposed to, you know, allow users to, well, not allow users, but it, the app was able to mint tokens for, you know, specific Ethereum addresses based on users that were in their database, okay? So the request comes in, and it hits this view, right? It's got a few parameters. It's got an account, right? This is the Ethereum account, and then the number of tokens. And I have basically some... Uh, you know, requirements that the request actually has those parameters when they come in, and if not, the API throws an exception, all right? So we just fetch that data off the request, we read the account, we also read the uh, number of tokens from the parameters, all right? And then I wrote a function here uh, that basically mints the tokens. It just does that. It, it, it uh, basically takes the account, takes the number of tokens, and uh, does this with Web3. This is actually a function that I've written and, and defined uh, in a different file, but it uses Web3 um, to talk to the blockchain and actually use the smart contract and mint the tokens, right? And when it's finished, basically we build a response object um, we tell that it worked. We you know, return the same request for parameters that came uh, initially. And we also show the transaction hash. So that's really important user experience for uh, someone whenever they saw the tokens were minted. You know, if the request is successful, it'll return a transaction hash and you can surface that to the user so they can see, oh, hey, this happened and I can go check on the status of this transaction on the blockchain, okay? So, and if, you know, any of this stuff broke, basically we rescue the exception um, and we just return the error um, with the API. So that's an example of the code. There's a lot going on here. Uh, I don't want to give away all the code of this project, but that's, you know, just an example of how I sort of abstracted away some of the blockchain um, pieces of the app into an API and I was able to interact with smart contracts programmatically inside a bigger application, okay? So I hope you all found this helpful. If you're trying to build a project, maybe you might have gleaned something from this. And maybe you're trying to build a project yourself uh, or hiring somebody, you know, this is an example something that I've done. Uh, if you want to reach out to work on a project, like I said, you can always email me at gregory at dappuniversity.com to talk about, you know, whatever you're working on. So I hope you all like this video. Again, until next time, uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and also click the thumbs up button down below and my courses. You can download them for free on my website at dappuniversity.com. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.